prefer the lonely places, wandering behind a pair of bird dogs in search of what's over the next hill. My passion for upland hunting has led me to multiple states. These travels have allowed me to see the beauty of this great land and meet some interesting people. I hope to introduce you to many of these people and encourage you to look for what's over your next hill. Today I'm talking with Alan Peoples of Piedmont, Oklahoma, Chief of the Wildlife Division of the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Alan is a lifelong bird hunter and instrumental in many of Oklahoma's quail programs. The podcast, as always, is sponsored by Pike Gear, an upland hunter who hunts hard, needs clothing that is light, makes hunting easier, not harder. An upland hunter is always on the move and always thinking about his next move. He needs clothing that can move with him, clothing that doesn't hold him back or weigh him down. Pike Gear is designed for upland hunters who are always on the go and always dreaming about their next hunting trip. Visit PikeGear.com to find the best upland hunting clothing you'll ever wear. Follow Pike Gear on Facebook and Instagram. And Alan, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Okay. Well, <coughs> I, uh, I am a native Oklahoman. I, uh, I grew up at Guyman, Oklahoma. I was a 12-year senior at Guyman High School, and uh, my grandfather loved to hunt, and my father loved to hunt, and they brought me up to love to hunt and fish, uh, so much so that I, I made that my my lifelong career. Was, um, were there pheasant out there when you were a boy? Yes, sir, there were. We, we hunted a lot of roosters at the time, and blue quail. Um, you know, my dad worked in the oil field out there, and he had a pretty good, he was out there every day, and he knew a lot of people, and you know, where the good habitat was, and where the birds were, and uh, you know, the best blue quail habitats, old junk machinery, and abandoned homesteads, and corrals that had grown up in tumbleweeds, and uh, it was kind of funny that, you know, you would my dad's way of hunting blue quail was we'd flush them from the pickup and we'd watch them down and then drive over there and try to flush them again <laughs> and watch them down. And the second flush line was best with those blue quail. Well, and so normally about the third flush we'd turn the dogs out. <laughs> and you know the key with blue quail is you got to split them up. Yeah. If, you, if you don't split them up they're going to run. And they, they can run. <laughs> so. We hunt a lot of blue quail, we hunt a lot of pheasants. You know, I'll never forget uh, when the game warden told us we couldn't shoot pheasants out of the back of the pickup anymore. Anymore? We started. <laughs> My dad would tie a, an old nylon ski rope between us boys and we'd drag it over the top of that Milo stubble. <laughs> Boy, that was work too now. You drag a ski rope over Milo stubble all day long, you know you did something. But you get just about every pheasant out of the stubble. That's yeah, right. you do. You do. <laughs> now, how can you shoot and, and hold on to a ski rope? The blockers got most of the shooting. Okay. You know, the, the key to success is be a blocker. Yeah. And so my granddad was usually a blocker. Yeah, he got to do all the shooting. Yeah. So, you know, I'd grown up in a panhandle, but, uh, you know, my, my grandparents, and my, my father grew up at Sharon, my mother grew up at Camargo, and so, you know, when we wanted to go deer hunting or bobwhite hunting or turkey hunting, you know, we went there south of Woodward. Where there was some water. Yeah. And some there's trees. some water and trees. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's been the, the biggest, probably, besides Oklahoma City traffic, getting used to all the tall trees. You know, I was a prairie dog. Grew up out there in the panhandle where we didn't have a lot of trees. So, I mean, you had, did you know when you were a boy, like when you were in high school, that you wanted to do something involving wildlife for a living? I just knew that I loved to hunt and fish. And honestly, uh, you know, my father was in the wool field, and <clears throat> I I spent the better part of ten years in the wool field. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought you yeah. came straight out of college. Well, when, when no, when Penn Square Bank fell, um, my uh, roustabout company out of ISI, I started receiving Chapter Eleven notices in the mail about once a week. Mm. And uh, so I actually commuted from by side of Weatherford uh, as pre-vet, pre-veterinarian. Okay. And uh, I did that for a couple of years. And uh, then I heard about this job where you get paid to go hunting and fishing. <laughs> so we packed up the truck and moved to Stillwater. 
and uh, I was married at the kid at the time and had had one child, my son. And uh, I got an undergrad degree from OSU, and then uh, I was encouraged by a, a long-term friend to apply for graduate school uh, because the Grand National Quail Foundation over at Enid was going to fund a study on Bob White Quail. And of course, you bet, I'm in on that. And so I did that. I was selected and I spent about three years studying quail over between Cleo and Aline on the Cimarron River. That's neat country. Some of the best quail habitat there is, bear none. Even to this day? Even to this day. Um, so I had like two weeks ago, Alan, I went to Minnesota and hunted in the Rough Grouse Society National Grouse and Woodcock Hunt. Yep. Which is, I believe, modeled after that Grand Absolutely. National Quail Hunt. Absolutely. Well, uh, and I have evidence of that because uh, after I, I got my degree, uh, the wildlife department hired me to to be the first upland game bird biologist in Oklahoma. And as a part of my initial duties, I monitored the Grand National Quail Hunt over at Eden. And I think it was my second year on the job, uh, some guys that were some of the co-founders of the Grand National Quail Hunt also founded the Grand National Rough Grouse and Woodcock Hunt. Okay. And so they brought Dan Desiker, the Rough Grouse Biologist with the Rough Grouse Society down to Enid so he could watch me monitor the quail hunt and in exchange I got to go to Minneapolis and go to the Rough Grouse Woodcock Hunt and monitor that hunt and we did that for two years and so that was well, just speaking for my for my own benefit, I think maybe we need a reevaluation. I need to maybe hunt the, the Grand National Quail Hunt next year so I can I can do a <laughs> modern comparison. You know, those guys, it, what a quality group of guys. I mean, it. I'm not sure what the first year of the Grand National Quail Hunt was, but. Do you think it was, it was probably like, in the 70s? Maybe the 80s? No, it was earlier than that. Oh, uh, really? it, was, it was Harold Grondike and Irvin Ballenbach and, and some of those guys over there, true conservationists, but they saw the value in quail hunting. It was a, it was a, a commodity that, that we had that other people wanted. Yeah. And so they, they would bring these movie stars and sports celebrities and big business people who were they were particularly interested in you know bring them to Enid take them on a good quality quail hunt and maybe they would consider putting their business there and it worked uh, some of the some people claim the reason that Vance Air Force Base is still in Enid is because some of the Grand Air Force, Force military boys loved to quail hunt I mean, okay. so I don't know how much truth there, there's got to be some truth there might be there should be but uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all you know, that's a little bit about me. My granddad always had dogs, my dad had dogs, and I had dogs. And You know, I had the opportunity to, to study quail, and somehow or another, you know, just in the cards, I guess, that about the time, actually, I had planned on getting my PhD. I had the field work, and I only liked eight hours and having my PhD, but I couldn't hardly pass up the opportunity to be Oklahoma's first upland game bird biologist. Yeah. So. And then quail was really a big part of your life and have, have been Absolutely. I mean, Almost for 30 been. years probably, right? Yeah. And, well, and that's beyond when you were hunting as a kid. Yeah, yeah. I started with the wildlife department in October of 1990. So 29 years. Yeah. This is October of 19, 29 years. And that was your official title was quail biologist. Upland game bird biologist. Okay. I Which really meant quail biologist. And pheasant. And yeah. prairie chicken. What a dismal failure I was at prairie yeah, chicken. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> not my fault. <laughs> but anyway, quail was my primary focus. Um, as a matter of fact, not only was I probably the first technical assistance biologist, if you want to grow quail on your place, call me and I'll, I'll give you a site visit 
Okay. And, you know, we can talk about what you want, what you've got, where you want to go, how much money you want to spend. And I'd write you up a wildlife management plan to try to help you better your habitat for quail. I, I know what it's going to mostly say. It's going to say less cows. It's well, it's you can still, say. you know, for a, for a cowboy, you, you, there are ways to manage for cows and quail. Uh, as a matter of fact, our old saying with the wildlife department is the, and it goes clear back to Aldo Leopold, really, three tools for managing quail, the plow, the cattle, and the match. Okay, so we use all of them. And so cattle can be beneficial Absolutely. when they're applied appropriately. You know, quail evolved in an ecosystem with a large herbivore. You know, back then it was buffalo, mm -hmm. but so we use Hereford or Angus. Yeah. But we still use fire, and we still we still do fire guards, strip disking. It's all, you know, quail are an early successional species. And so your job as a quail manager is you're in a constant battle against succession. You want to set succession back all the way, and that's not a one-time shot. And that's by fire or by plow, and sometimes by cow. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, I give a lot of technical assistance. I mean, I would I'd run from Boy City to Miami to Durant, you know, and then Hollis. Have you seen an ebb and flow of that? I mean, to me, that seems like something that I don't know. Probably more recently, landowners are taking an interest in having diverse opportunities with their land. But well, that may have been true back in the back in the 90s too and I just didn't realize. You know my granddad was a farmer and a lot of his peers, particularly his neighbors, used to gripe because he was a dirty farmer. He didn't spend a lot of time worrying about weeds and you know dirty bar ditches or dirty fence rows but guess what? He, My granddad knew that not only was it cheaper to be a dirty farmer, you had more wildlife. Yeah. And he, you know, he had a working man's PhD when it came to wildlife management. Oh, and, and I kind of took that a step further. You know, I, I studied it. I read the textbooks and then I tried to apply that on the ground. And in 1990, we started one of the most extensive quail research projects in history out on the pack saddle, wildlife management area. And we ran that study for 10 years. And just so happened that the technology and Albert yeah. Gregory would have been involved with that. Yeah, I, I Alvin was a technician on, on the area then. Yep. So when I was a boy, Alvin worked for my dad when he was a teenager. Yeah. He worked on my, my mom and dad's farm. Okay. And yeah. so when I was like 10, 12 years old, Alvin would have been 16, 18 and he'd be driving a tractor or a swather for my dad. Yeah. And when he would come visit his mom and dad in Balco, Al would come a lot of times over to my, to my mom and dad's house and see my mom and dad. So I stayed in touch with Alva. Um, even when I was in college and older, I would see him a couple of times a year. Yeah. Think, too. Alva was one of a kind. Yeah, he was really neat, yeah. really nice man. Yeah, well, and and you know, Alva was at Pack Saddle when I did my research out there. And it was fortunately for us the technology with radio telemetry had advanced to the point where they finally developed a radio transmitter that was about the size of the button on your shirt, and we. We were on the cutting edge of wildlife science at the time. We we learned a lot of stuff about quail that people never knew. And that was in the 90s? In the 90s. You said it was a 10-year study in the 90s? Initially. Right? Initially it was a 10-year study. And, you know, we learned stuff. We Like what? Coined the phrase gypsy hen. Okay. A, you know, a hen would mate with a rooster, mm -hmm. lay a clutch of eggs, and then she'd get the rooster incubating, she'd go mate with somebody else. I've known some eggs. ladies like that. Yeah, we call them, we call them the gypsy hen, and, and that had never been scientifically documented. Uh, we documented... And that kind of runs co contrary to what you would have probably expected nature to do, but it yeah. makes sense in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, polygamy is the key to success when you're... When you have, you know, 15 little ones and not very many of them make it. Yeah. So. You need as many babies on the ground as possible. Absolutely. And two or three clutches of them if you can get them. Yeah. Um, 
And we also learned that our quail in Oklahoma can sometimes move long distances. There's two periods of in increased movement, the fall shuffle and the spring breakup. Okay. And you know exactly why they do that, probably a variety of reasons. But Genetic diversity to the certain extent. It's yeah. distributing the gene pool. Uh, you know, common sense would tell you that there, it distributes the genetics of the flock. And also, you know, a lot of people, oh man, we saw a lot of birds out there when we was duff hunting in September and they're gone. Well, let's see. What happened between September and middle of November? Chances are we've had a killing frost. Probably. Okay. Those chicks from hatching to six weeks, all they eat is insects. Mm -hmm. Okay. Grass. At about six to eight weeks, their their diet changes from insects over to more of a granivore. They start eating weed seeds and domestic grade seeds, but they'll always eat a bug. They find a high protein, high protein, good amino acid breakup. Um, which, by the way, I, uh, that kind of diverted. A large part of my research from the Grand National was studying the effects of supplemental feed on bye bye quail. And, you know, people put out food plots and quail feeders and stuff thinking, well, I'm going to help my quail through survival and whatnot. But what we found was is that, with, particularly with a quail feeder, um, you concentrate the birds. For the predators. Consequently, you concentrate the predators. Yeah. And so it's kind of a catch-22. Now, there were times, like a winter emergency, when we had extended periods of time where the ground was frozen, snow cover, ice cover, a feeder might be the, the difference between survival or not. Gotcha. But more the, more times than not, that, that quail feeder was uh, a significant cause of quail mortality. We also studied the nutritional value of domestic grains versus native weed seeds. So I we, at the time, we had various instruments to measure crew protein, crew fat, you know, socks on apparatus to use an alcohol to distillate the fat. And <laughs> wow. It was about the time that the high-pressure liquid chromatograph machine, HPL machine, C mm -hmm. machine, so we could break those proteins into the various amino acids. And we knew, poultry science told us that the, the critical amino acids for poultry are cysteine and methionine. And so that was another aspect of the study. We ran Milo, corn, millet. See, it's one way better than the other. Along with western ragweed, common sunflower, croton, all the gamut of native foods. And guess what happened? The native stuff's probably better. What Mother Nature put out there is nutritionally the best. Bar none. Western ragweed topped the scale. I've never heard that. I, 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 I never knew that. Not only is it the number one quail food in Oklahoma, but it's the most nutritional with crude fat and crude protein. Ah. And the best amino acid breakup. You know, so. And those guys dump, that, I mean, we do it in Oklahoma too, but those guys down in Texas dump millions of bushels yeah. of corn on the ground. Yeah. Well, if you'll read on those corn sacks, it gives you the aflatoxin levels. It was unfit for human or livestock consumption. <laughs> so what are you going to do with it? Well, let's sell it to the deer guys. Gotcha. Well, guess what? The deer don't eat all that. I don't know. And, and the parts per million of aflatoxin that would kill a cow or a deer is a lot more than it would take to kill a quail. Yeah, quail not very big. Okay, and, and the longer that grain, specifically corn, sets in a feeder, the more aflatoxins with the wet and dry, hot and cold, it'll actually increase the aflatoxin level setting in the feeder. I didn't know that either. So are we shooting ourselves in the foot? Every deer hunter in Oklahoma puts out corn. Mm -hmm. Most of them. So are we shooting ourselves in the foot? Is that Could that be one cause of quail population decline? We've never been able to prove that, but it, it's a theory. And it, it makes logical sense. Yeah, it could happen, especially in certain circumstances. Well, my real world, world experience would be consistent that there's no the the only benefit to having quail feeders 
is that hunters kill more quail. You concentrate them. Yeah, they're easier to find. You drive right up to where that feeder's at and dump your dogs out. There's going to be a covey within a hundred yard circle of there most generally. Yep. So you don't have to work as hard, but I don't think it increases your numbers at all. In fact, it may do the exact opposite of that. As a quail hunter, it sure makes them easier to find. It does. <laughs> I mean, and, and sometimes that's not, I mean, that's really not the point in a lot of yeah. ways. Uh, well, you know, that's a lot of what we were looking at with the Pack Saddle Quail Project was, you know, rates and causes of mortality. And with the advent of radio telemetry, we were more able to keep a, keep a handle on that. I mean, we found those birds twice a day. And we, we lived with those birds. Wow. And, you know, we had four-wheelers and horses and everything else trying to keep up with them and, and airplanes. Because, like our, I say, our birds would move. I mean, some of these birds are moving in excess of 50 miles. Wow. And, and these radios would only, I mean, they're the size of the button of your shirt. They had limited range on their transmitting. So you'd have to cover the ground to get them, to well, get them picked up. You know, again, it was new technology. A company named Wildlife Materials out of Carbondale, Illinois, were making these radios for us. I'll never forget the old boy's name was Bob Hawkins. I called Bob up and I said, hey Bob, you sell me bad radios, man, they're quitting on me. And he said, I don't, I don't, know, I don't think that, you know, it's, we've got good quality control. And we come find out Bob wasn't selling us bad radios. <laughs> Our quail were just running off. They were moving further yeah. than you thought. In the, in the fall breakup and in the spring shuffle. And so what we started doing is, uh, I had an airplane out of Woodward. We put that Yagi antenna on the strut and we started flying circles. And we found them. Yeah. We found a lot of those radios that I told Bob about. How low, did they, how low did they have to fly? It was low <laughs> and slow. <laughs> and I never got so sick in my life with being up in that airplane in August, low and slow, trying to find those birds. Man, I, I had him set me on the ground more than once. To, <laughs> and it, I didn't mind that five mile walk back to the truck one little bit. It gave me a chance to sober up. <laughs> That's great. But we did that for 10 years. So do you think that that big movement also might be Mother's Nature, Mother Nature's way of reintroducing birds into habitat that has has recovered or has has changed in some way to be conducive to having quail, whereas maybe two years ago it wasn't? You know, next time I run into Mother Nature, I'll ask her, but I don't understand. Let me give you an example. We caught a hen and her brood down on the river, down on the South Canadian River. And we followed that covey up to the town of Arnett. Okay. From the Pack Saddle Bridge up to Arnett, which I used to know exactly, I think that's 17 miles. Wow. And she went to town. And she didn't do that all in one day, did she? Uh, didn't take her very long. Oh, man. Like, like three or four days. Huh. And with her brood. With her brood. And she crossed some open wheat fields, you know, a high risk activity. So there had, had to be some compelling biological reason. Well, here's her kicker. That. She spent the summer in a, in, a, in a lady's garden in downtown Arnett and then moved back to the river. 17 miles right back down there to the South Canadian River within a half a mile where we caught her. I'll be. You tell me. I, I, I don't know why that was. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, she spent the summer in downtown Arnett in the garden avoiding house cats and BB guns <laughs> and then went back to the South Canadian River. And Arnett's were not very big, but no. still, the, the idea of Metropolitan quail, and I, that's just a bit of a stretch, but really not. Yeah, and and you know, we over the years we saw a lot of movement. You know, th those two peak periods. But uh, I wonder if her brood did the same thing when she was gone. I don't know. Wouldn't that be interesting to know if those birds picked up on that habit and would do the same thing? Huh. But you know. Uh, I fellow quail researchers like I'm, I'm good friends with a fellow that runs the Albany Area Quail Management Project and they're associated with Auburn University there in South Georgia on the, in the plantation type setting and uh, their birds don't move that far. Uh, 
Or at least they haven't been able to catch them moving that far. Well, they pretty sure they don't move that far. How about any of those West Texas birds? You know, um, some of the research they've done down in South Texas, uh, their birds don't move that far either. And, you know, some of the stuff that, that uh, Dale Rollins and the Roland Plains Quail Research Ranch is doing there at Roby, Texas, they're not getting that long distance movement that I'm aware of. So maybe it's unique to the western Western Oklahoma, you know? I, you know, I don't know. It's hard to say. We we don't know about other people's birds, but we know ours did it. Uh, well, like you said, if I run into Mother Nature, I'll ask her. You know, another thing as a bird hunter that was very interesting to me is, I don't know, about year five or something, the commissioners were saying, okay, well now, how does that help the hunter? We need to we need to devise a study to how does that affect the hunter? Well, so what we started doing is uh, we would select hunters when when hunters would come to pack saddle. I'd just stop them and say, "Hey, would you mind if I follow you around for the day?" And you'd have the the antenna and yep, be I'd tracking have the receiver and the antenna. I'd be on a four wheeler, a horseback. And I would, you know, I would be hopefully out of gun range or hopefully where I wouldn't mess with their dogs. And I'd set up on a hill and... The idea that you didn't want to affect no. what they were doing as a hunter or what their dogs were doing. The bird's activity or theirs. Okay. But I can tell you, as the season progressed, when those birds heard a door slam, they took off. Ah, when, ah. They, when they heard a... Somebody yelled, they took off. Uh, the guys that did, did really See, now well. See, that's good stuff, Alan. The that guys that the successful hunters are in stealth mode. They don't run beaver collars on their dogs. They don't do a bunch of yelling and hollering or whistling. They pull up, turn their engine off, coast in there, ease out of the truck, don't slam any doors. Quietly open and kennel door. They're in, they're in, they're in stealth out. mode. I'll be dug on. Uh, another thing that I learned was always trust your dog. When that dog gets birdie, give him some time. Because more times than not, a dog would get birdie and, and I knew those birds were right there. They were close. And the, and the dogs would run by them and get birdie. You know, they just couldn't couldn't locate them and the hunters would come on come on let's go you know and they'd walk right on by them they were they were on march yeah they were going right. to get they over to the top from, of that hill or where they, they were going, going from point a to point b and you know they wanted to burn some shoe leather well i'm saying always trust your dog but and i have to tell you my experience personally has been that when i hunt by myself just me and my dogs I find more birds and kill more birds. And I think it's for that very reason. Because I'm not trying to keep up or, you know, when I'm with somebody, it, we pull up to a place and it's like, hey, we're going to walk over to that fence line and then back up to this hill and then we'll come back to the truck. And whether you intend to or not, when you set those parameters of your hunt, it's, it almost becomes like a, like a race or a, you know, and, and you're making... You've got that goal that you're getting to, and, and when I'm by myself, I'm just like, okay, dogs, get out there and we'll find them. Yeah. And I'm not in a hurry to go anywhere. I'm just watching the dogs, letting them do their thing. My grandpa, bless his heart, his favorite saying was always trust your dogs. And you know, I, I've had that, I've carried that with me all along, and and, and I, I, you know, I had scientific evidence to back it up. Always trust your dogs because. A lot, of, a lot of times they'll get birdie at a porcupine or, you know, at whatever. But if they're birdie, why pull them off of it? That's right. Give them a little time to, you know, do what they do. And then I guarantee you, more times than not, it'll pay off. Even if you're having, like, uh, unproductive points. Yep. There's probably birds there is what you're saying. Yep. Somewhere close. Yep. Even if you're stomping around and you're not getting birds in the air, there may yep. be a cubby somewhere right there close. Back out, back out, make a bigger circle. Uh-huh. You know, go go up wind, you know. Uh, give, it a, give it a chance, you know. Uh, that, it's helped me a lot as a bird hunter. You know, when, when that dog gets birdie, there was probably a bird there. And, and if, there, if it wasn't a bird, 
if it was a porcupine or whatever, you haven't lost anything except a little time. That's right. And if you're a bird hunter, you're not in a hurry anyway. That's you're, right. You shouldn't be. That's exactly right. I'll be done. And that's really good information. I mean, and I, it, you kind of know that intuitively, but to hear that you've seen it in the field really drives that home in yeah. ways. Yeah. I believe it's helped me as a bird hunter, you know. And it's, it's helped me to be more patient with my dogs. Yeah. You know, because it's, but there's nothing more satisfying to me than to see that dog lock up and to walk up there and flush that cubby and you feel that thrill you know you see that gray blur and you're trying to pick out a target to me that's good as it gets yeah it doesn't get any better than that. I, as i've gotten older and done it more i love seeing people experience that for the very first time so i'm standing off my dog's on point of course i'm excited too and I'm trying to get them up there and get them in them birds and oftentimes they're worried about doing something wrong. You know, they're worried about busting the birds early or or not being in position to take a shot or, yep. you know, doing something wrong. People are just naturally hesitant for the, when they're doing something for the first time. Yeah. And so you, you'll hear me on video, I mean, get up there, get up there, get up there, buddy, you know. And, and they step up there and then birds come <clears throat> Blowing out of that plum thicket and the little well, you know, I mean, it's not all it's not all about shooting the bird. You know, of course you gotta get a bird every once in a while to keep your dog honest, but to me it's about the dog. Mm. You know. Have you ever met Delmar Smith? I haven't. I know who he is. Oh, I'm good friends with Delmar. Delmar comes out to the Wildlife Expo at Lazy every year. I talked to him this year, back in September. Uh, I think Delmar told me he's ninety three years old. I'll be. Still driving. <laughs> Still love to bird hunt, and uh, I'm I'm convinced there's not a more patient human being than Delmar Smith, world renowned dog trainer. Mm -hmm. He's he's literally held dog training seminars all over the world, and that's what he's known for: is training those bird dogs. You know, dogs and horses working threes and sevens. You ever heard him say that? Huh? And they're either going to learn it on the third time, or it'll take them seven times. <laughs> And, and he's right. That's pretty funny. Remember, I said that. I will. Remember, I, will. I said that. Delmar said that. Delmar said that. Reason seven. Reason seven. And so, you know, to be a dog trainer, you have to be patient. Well, and you know, that's great advice even for somebody that's not a dog, dog trainer, but that has a point in dog and is just trying to sort through some stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they may not figure it out the first time. They may not figure it out the third time. It may take seven times. Yeah, be, be a little patient. You know, they, they'll get there. Yeah. I, I love... I love the teamwork with my dogs, right? So, especially my little short hair mix that's a rescue dog. Man, she wants to kill birds. Just, that's, that, that is, that's what God created her for. Yeah. And yeah. she's figured out she can't do that without me, right? So she'll yeah. go and find them, and pointing those birds is her way of saying to me, hey boss, Get over here and do your I've shit. done my job now, you did. She's very disappointed when you miss. Oh, and, and I mean, and even when I'm walking in on a cubby, right, every muscle, every fiber in her body is tuned towards the idea of, I want to kill that bird. Mm -hmm. I want to kill those birds, you know. And just as soon as the shooting's over and the birds are in the vest, she's done. She's off to do it again, you yeah. know. It's but But that focus and that intensity and that desire all boil down into this teamwork and hey, hey boss we're in this together I got to have you over here pulling your your fair share of the, mm -hmm. of the weight uh, that fascinates me every single yeah. time now I've had some pointers that wouldn't really uh, that worried about me <laughs> they were out there to hunt and you know sometimes they'd find them and they really didn't care if I was there or not yeah yeah but they might wait a minute or they might not wait at all yeah. if you were over the hill they wouldn't wait on you at all yeah. I know what you're saying I typically ran a, a, at least one pointer and a, and a setter you know you kind of got that dog that ranges out there cover more ground then you got that dog hanging a little closer that would be a little more thorough. Yeah. And that, that's a good combination. Good combination. It is. That's always worked well for me. And, and I know you and I have talked about this, and JD and I talked about this a little bit, but the 
the Department of Wildlife has been instrumental in all those studies that you're talking about. It's been a big focus of the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation to try to help hunters understand more about bobwhite quail and upland yep. birds in general. Yep. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because the department ought to be, by God, proud of that. And a lot of that, if not all of that, over the last 30 years has flowed through you and come across your desk. Yeah. And the summary of all we've learned, <laughs> I wish I could... I wish I could summarize it in, in, you know, hard, cold facts that would solve the problems of the world. But, you know, we, it, it all it's full, came back full circle to quail habitat depends on weather and habitat. You know, um, they're such a fickle little bird. Yeah. What, what I would prescribe as the perfect conditions I might miss it 180 degrees. No, they, you know, some of these, some of these springs where we're thinking, man, here we go, here we go. Going to have green, going to have bugs, going to have things working perfect, and then, you know, fall of 2015. You know, where we just. No, 15 was pretty good. Actually, 15 was pretty good. 16 was not. 17 was a bust. Oh, and yeah, 16 was tough. One little, one little interesting fact. I shot birds in 17, but they were a little tough to come by because it was so stinking dry in yeah. November and December. You know, a lot of people don't realize it, but the the 50s were actually drier than the 30s. Okay. But our farming were, practices were different. Exactly. You know, 30s were brutal, but 50s, it was hotter and less rain, but the farming practices had improved. Now, and there's a bunch, and not not a lot, but there's there's what would have been dryland fields that in the probably the were broke out in the twenties, maybe even in the teens. That in Beaver County now, that it has this red grass, and my dad calls it CR grass, and I think that refers to a conservation reserve. Um, program that predates CRP mm -hmm. that was in place in the 50s yeah. where men were encouraged to plant those 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 small were paid by the government probably to, to plant those and they planted a specific variety of grass that in the fall is just the reddest you know, red topped. I, I I know you've seen it, but yeah. Dad has always called that CR grass. Is what he's always called that. I'm not familiar with that term, but uh, anyway, where I was going with the, the drought of the '50s, you know, it quit raining in '53, and '54 and '55 were absolutely brutal. It started raining a little bit in '56. 1957, they finally got some much needed rain. Well, what happened in that time frame, is like I was telling you a while ago, nature set back succession through heat and drought. Gotcha. And so once it started raining in 1957, 1958 was the best quail year we've ever had. I know that because my grandfather constantly reminded me of that. I was born in December of 58, and he had to quit quail hunting so I could be bored. <laughs> and he said, the best quail year I've ever had. <laughs> well, my <laughs> best quail year would either be 87 or 88 and 15. You know? Well, okay, think about that. 2011. Oh, it's horrible. 90 some days over 100 degrees. Just absolutely brutal. Record setting. Mm -hmm. Okay, 11, 12 were just killers. Mm -hmm. 13 wasn't much better. I at my house in Guyman, uh, north there north of Guyman, I went 11 months without a me without measurable precipitation at my house. So it started raining again in 14. 2015, we had a dang good quail year. Yeah, it was a great year. It was a lot of well, fun. Well, so what happened there? Mother Nature set back succession, and then she let it rain, and we had quail. And weeds. Had, That's a lot of weeds. Had weeds, had bugs, had cover, and it all worked. Yeah. Um, and, and there's no way really on an individual basis to recreate that on the scale that you'd have to recreate it to have that kind of quail production year exactly. in a year out. Exactly. You know, um, and with the advent of clean farming practices, increased use of insecticide, pesticides, conversion of native grass pastures to introduced exotics, particularly in 
in northwest Oklahoma, the old world blue stems, yeah. which are basically an eco ecological desert. Uh, a lot has changed. That's a right. lot has changed. And, you know, from central Oklahoma and east, Bermuda grass and fescue, uh, the rotation on the pine cuts. You know, we used to have a lot of quail in eastern Oklahoma. But, you know, actually the timber industry is getting back to some of the some of the harvesting practices that are beneficial to quail. We're starting to have, I mean, Quail Forever hosts an annual hunt down in uh, McCurdy County. I'll be. And they find quail? I'll be. Well, good. They're doing good down there. So, but, you know, but the thing about it is, Ryan, we are the last of the Mohicans. Historically, Oklahoma has been on the western fringes of Bob White carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, whether you want to call it global warming or, you know, whatever, but uh, we're it. Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas now are the last remaining premier quail hunting states. When they showed at the at the RGS banquet, they showed a map that showed the southern fringe of the rough grouses range and how that has advanced yeah. consistently northward over yeah. the last two decades. Yeah. Right, and of course as a quail hunter, I'm sitting there thinking about that shrinking in, really kind of coming from east to west. Yeah. Um, in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking that's going on with Bob White Quail. Well, and you know what, the secret's out too, because I think it, I think it was in 2015, um, we had 47 states and three Canadian provinces were counted in the town of Beaver, Oklahoma. That's right. I heard 43, but 47 would not surprise me. Uh, you know, that's, wow. I, I meet people and have met people from all over the United States. You know, I, we're, we're a member of two different associations, the, the Southeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, as well as the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Mm -hmm. And I told my peers at more than one meeting that I have the most popular wildlife management area in the United States. Prove me wrong. And nobody could. Yeah, I can't. Imagine. Who else has got 43 states and three Canadian provinces represented on their wildlife management area? Well, and you and I spoke about this, but the economic impact of the management that occurs there at the Beaver River WMA and the way that that brings people into my little community is. It, well, it's unrecognized by many of the people that actually live there. Mm -hmm. um, I see it, and I appreciate what the department has done, and I've expressed that repeatedly. Uh, I wish that the people in my community would understand how important that place is to what little uh, economic or commercial activity that we have in that little, in that little town. Well, September 1. You cannot find an open motel room in Beaver, Oklahoma. Dove season. You go to the Pizza Hut, the Mexican food place, Love's Subway, mm -hmm. it's solid camo. That's right. You know, same way with the second Saturday in November. You know, they're absolutely. Buying, they're buying motel rooms, they're buying food, they're buying gas, they're wearing out the little Dollar General store there. Uh, I spend a lot of money out there. Thank you. <laughs> and we take that out of, uh, I mean, and, and if you're only there for brief periods of time, it's hard to understand how little commercial activity there is, uh, how little economic opportunity there is for the, the citizens in my county beyond those times that you're talking about. I mean, we've got some agriculture, we've got a little oil and gas production, and that oil and gas production has dropped dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, agriculture, uh, as it becomes more mechanized, there's fewer and fewer people that can rely on agriculture for income. Um, and so, you know, our population's going away, and, and if it wasn't for that WMA, things would be even tougher than they are in Beaver. You know, I remember, um, I used to work on the old T bar T and the oil field days. And I remember when some politicians were very upset when the wildlife department bought that ranch. And you know, they were favored, oh, they're taking all that money out of the tax base, their school's gonna go broke. And you know, man, you're just, you know, you're putting 
private ownership and the public ownership. All the same tired arguments we hear today. You know, I've been fighting that for 30 years, and, and for 30 years, my goal has been to find people more places to hunt and to make them better places to hunt. And, I, and, and our, our, our Alan, uh, I can tell you that my experience in the courtroom can add flavor to that. I see a lot of kids. Again, I see all the kids in Texas County and all the kids in Beaver County, they get in trouble. Uh, if they do something that warrants them getting arrested, then they come and appear in front of me. And of all of those children that I've seen for the last 20 years, the number of them that are hunters, that, are, that live a life where they're exposed to outdoor activities regularly, is not none, but a really, really low number. So if kids are out hunting and fishing, several judges tell me that. Yeah, if they're out <laughs> hunting and fishing, they're not doing that yeah. other stuff. No buzz, not buzz 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 good, buzz. You know, buzz. I did know buzz. Yeah. Lee West. Mm. You know, but those guys are well respected judges and they told me the same thing. Yeah, if they're out chasing quail, following a pair of bird dogs around, or uh, it's sitting in a deer stand, or calling a turkey, they're not doing the other stuff that we yeah. don't want them to be doing. Yep. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of value there. Uh, and really, when, when we start talking about how we're divvying up the dollar down here in the capital, I don't think that gets any play. Well, the thing about it is, is what a lot of people don't understand is the Department of Wildlife receives no tax appropriation. Okay? We subsist on the sale of hunting and fishing licenses. Mm -hmm. We dance with the one that brings us. Now, we, we also get uh, federal funds through the Wildlife Restoration Fund and Sport Fish Restoration Fund. What is that, the Pittman Robertson Act? Isn't that what they call it? Act, yeah. It's an 11% manufacturer's tax that is distributed through the Department of Interior back through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to the states. And it's based on a formula of number of acres in the state, a number of hunting and or fishing licenses sold. So when somebody calls, uh, gets online and, and buys a pair of Brent Pike's pants that I'm selling, uh, he's going to have a tax that's affixed to that, that's going to go to the federal government, and Oklahoma's going to get a portion of that. It's distributed back to us at the Wildlife Department. So us as hunters finance a big part, in fact, yeah. everything in Oklahoma relative to your agency. It, you know, it's a pretty good deal for us because of every quarter of license dollars, I get 75% matching funds. From the feds. From the feds. Oh, that's great. So, if and for these private organizations like Quail and Pheasants Forever, if they give me five hundred dollars, I can make two thousand out of it. I didn't know that. By matching funds. And, and what what I talked about with Dwayne Elmore, you know, was that the department takes money, that money, and some of it goes towards funding those studies that you talked about. Absolutely. You know, OSU, the Natural, Reco Natural Resource Ecology and Management School, NREM, is one of the biggest in the nation and one of the most avid wildlife research facilities. And they're almost totally funded by us. And, you know, there's some endowed uh, research chairs over there. The, you know, I was telling you earlier about Harold Grondike and, mm -hmm. and Urban Ballenbach started the Grand National Quail. I recognize that Ballenbach name okay. from talking with Irwin. Irwin was, Irwin Irwin was an arrow sprayer out of Kingfisher. Really? He told me one time I've killed more habitat than you can ever grow. I bet that's right. But he <laughs> loved a quail hunt. Huh. And so there are two endowed chairs over there. One of them's the Ballenbach chair. Mm -hmm. That'd be Dwayne, yep. Dr. Elmore. Yep. And one of them's the Grondike chair. Okay. Yeah. Who holds that, do you know? Uh, Yes, Sam Fullendorf. Okay. Yep. Uh, and Sam, Sam works with us on almost on a daily basis with research. Um, his background is in range science, but the plow the cow and the match. That's right. And so we're we're researching some stuff right now on how can we integrate grazing practices and quail management. 
that's part of the research we're doing right now. And by the way, we got some really cool technology going right now. We're hanging radios off a of coil that you can see on your computer screen. That's pretty neat. It's bouncing off a satellite. And so, it, you know, the days of me having to chase them with a Yagi antenna on a full with or a horseback, <laughs> uh, it's way too easy to do it now. I can pull them up on my computer screen. Oh, man. And uh, you get a lot of data points. I mean, that little transmitter's you can you can tell it how many times to transmit. Of course, the more the transmissions you have, the less your battery will yeah. work. But yeah. we're getting a data point every hour off those quill radios. That's amazing. So you know where that bird's at every single hour. And if it doesn't move for six hours, twelve hours, you can go out and see what killed it. Mortality switch. Yeah. Yeah. How cool is that? It's cutting edge technology, you know, and it's we've been doing it for. Well, we started in 1990. And all of that is designed to increase the ability of the department and private landowners in Oklahoma yep. to have a healthy, uh, huntable population of bob white quail or blue quail. Yeah. Um, seven years ago, when we started the, the phase that we're in right now, my goal, I told the researchers, I got to have a take home message for the managers. We've got to tailor this round of research. We got a pretty good grasp of rates and causes of quail mortality. We know mammals get about 25, raptors get about 25, weather gets about 25, and the rest we don't know. Okay. I don't think we need to keep kicking that dead horse. What we need to know are things like we just talked about. What are the best grazing management practices to promulgate bop bop quail? What type of burning rotation do we need that best benefits bop quail? What, what type of burning regime produces the best insects? Quail like bugs. Yeah, that's where those, I mean, uh, Weston showed me those burn uh, tracks out yep. there yep. where they were going to do different burns at different times of the year yep. to compare the results. Measure the insect biomass and diversity. That's so cool. I should have yeah. been a biologist. Well, it's interesting stuff, but you know, at the end of the day, it can be frustrating. All this stuff we've learned, we should have had a lot of quail, right? We're, we're so smart about quail, we ought to be able to grow them. No, I mean, I don't think you're ever going to be able to. Well, uh, I've spent my career trying to figure out how to do it. Yeah. And I, I know some stuff that works, and I know some stuff that doesn't work. So what comes next? Well, I'm retiring as of today. Today is your last day. <laughs> Today's it. <laughs> We're sitting uh, in your office, and you're all packed up. Yeah, all my stuff's gone. It's, it's going to be awkward. Uh, so the department's just going to completely forget about my white quail when you walk out the front door? I don't think so. I hope not. I don't think so. I think there's still lots of people around, including myself. I'll be one of those guys that can throw darts now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. And yours might mean a little bit more than mine. <laughs> well, I know where to throw them, for sure. Yeah. I got some targets. But, uh... Well, and no, I, I think don't. it's cool, and, and I don't know that I've expressed it effectively, but... All those advancements in our understanding, in in the world's understanding of bob white quail and bob white quail habitat, and the effects of of burning burn rates, the effect of uh, predators, all of that is something that you've been front and center with over the last thirty years. Well, I've had a lot of help. You know, we. Uh, but that stuff don't. I mean, don't sell yourself short. That stuff's come across your desk. At, at my retirement party the other day, one of my former professors from OSU showed up with a with an award to give me, and and uh, I was surprised at the number of publications that I've had my name on them or associated with the wildlife department, and how many times those that research has been cited worldwide. Wow, I had no idea, you know. Because when you're in the thick of it, you're not worried about Well, I mean, Oklahoma has set the standard for quail research. So. Under your direction. Well, I'm, like I say, I've had some, John Grondike's been a commissioner for 43 years. Really? And I, I met John um, okay. last time, really nice. John, John 
made it apparent 43 years ago he likes quail. And he wants more. And he wants more of them. <laughs> uh, you know, and we, we've had a lot of, of quail hunter commissioners over the years. Um, our newest commissioner, Rick Holder, down from the southwest part of the state, grew up quail hunting. Loves it. And well, Rick and, and I are going to get along real well. And, and I talked to you, well, I hadn't talked to you, but I talked to the man that, that the interview goes live this week, and he's what I call an adult onset hunter. And I don't know that you've heard that term, but he, he, really smart guy. Uh, he's an engineer. He owns his own engineering firm. And he'd hunted some as a boy, but not like really hunted. He'd gotten a little taste of it. But then he goes and gets him a job, starts making some money, and he meets a guy, a neighbor that had a Britney Spaniel. And he's like, hey, I might like to own me an appointing dog. So he starts going to the local put and take place, mm -hmm. buys him a Brittany. Well, next thing you know, 10 years later, and he's driving to Oklahoma and hunting quail in, in Beaver County, Oklahoma, and owns three pointing dogs. And that's a, I mean, that is his hobby. Is mm -hmm. He now hunts wild birds. And I have to tell you, I think that there's going to be an increase in the number of upland bird hunters in the near future. Because I think there's a lot of guys out there like Ben who are sitting in their office, they've reached a point in their careers where they've got a little money coming in, they've got some time, and they're looking for a hobby. And you can go now on Facebook, the, all those groups that we talked about earlier, you can go on Instagram, and you can see a lot of neat stuff mm -hmm. related to bird hunting. And that's going to be attractive to a certain percentage of the You know, I'm, I'm not a big social media guy, but I, I do belong to a couple of Facebook groups. One of them is Wild Bird Hunters. And uh, I never get tired of looking at those posts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, here's, here's our pheasants from South Dakota. You know, here's our huns from Montana. Here's our sharp tails from Wyoming. You know, it's just, there's just something about bird hunters. So... Like eight years ago, I would when I would see a vehicle there on the on the Beaver River WMA. I oftentimes if there were guys coming in with dogs, I'd stop and say hello, ask them how they done, kind of compare notes. And I almost always was the youngest guy in the group. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. And that has become less and less true now. Of course, I'm a little older now, but. I'm seeing more of those 35, 40-year-old guys that are out with their bird dogs chasing, chasing quail, out with their buddies. Uh, as before, you know, 10 years ago, it was like, I mean... It, you know, it's a little concerning to us, you know, with the video games and technology and the mall and, you know, kids moving from the country to the city. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's pretty easy to make a deer hunter. It, it, it's fairly easy to make a turkey hunter, you know, just go out there and set somewhere and be still and they'll come to you. Not that way with bird hunting. Yeah, it's tough to keep dogs. You gotta go. And, you know, for a, for a young kid, it's a lot of walking and not much shooting. And until they start enjoying what it's really about, it's hard to make a bird hunter. It is. It's hard to make a bird hunter. Easy to make a deer hunter, hard to make a bird hunter. Yeah. And we've got to be willing to include those adult onset hunters in a way. We've got to make this more inviting for them. And, and you know, I know uh, some of my people back home, they're like, we don't want those people from 43 different states coming and shooting our birds. And my take on that has always been, we got plenty of birds. Come on out here and bring your money. They're bringing money to the community. Yeah. Um, you know, I got a little different take on that, I guess. I, I, uh, my job has been focused on providing people a place to go. Mm -hmm. We do, I was telling you earlier, we do one of the most intensive hunter surveys in the United States. That's right, we talked about that. And almost without exception, did you hunt last year or not? Nope. Why didn't you hunt? Well, not any place to go. If you want to watch the hair on the back of my neck stand up, you just tell me I don't have a place to go. Yeah. In Oklahoma, you got 1.3 million acres you mm -hmm. can go to. Some of the best quail habitat in the world. I've worked hard to get more places to hunt. I've worked hard 
to make those places better. And I'm, you know, I'm proud of that. Well, and I can tell you, Alan, that I have been on the bench in the county where I grew up, uh, where I went to school and graduated from high school, where, I mean, there's 5,000 people, give or take, in Beaver County, and I can call 3,500 of them by name, right? There's not many places in Beaver County that I can't hunt if I bother to go and ask. And uh, I still hunt on the Beaver River WMA just about as much as I hunt in the What a beautiful else. place. It is. What a, I mean, I love it out there. I do too. Of course, that's my home also, but uh, they don't have to ask me where I'm going to go for the quail opener. Well, they know where I'm going. When you come to that part of the world, look me up. We're going to shoot a quail together. It'd be an honor to, to do that. Um, anything we, we have, have a lot more spare time now. It sounds like. <laughs> I appreciate what you've done for Oklahoma and for the Bob White quail. Thank you. Uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think you'd like to share with me or, or talk about? Well, I uh, just remember that your tax dollars don't go to support the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife. Your hunting license dollars do. And, you know, we, uh, we need all the support we can get from our constituents. Uh, over across the street here, a lot of times they're not necessarily interested in what the average hunter wants they tend to sometimes be more interested in what will get them reelected and I guarantee you you know hunters in Oklahoma we estimate there'd be about 350,000 of them but it's an, an unheard voice yeah it's pretty quiet it's an unheard voice that uh, you know when, when you hear of something that's going on over at the legislature that you may not agree with Maybe you should talk to your legislator and tell them how you feel about... I do. Well, um, thank you. I do. <laughs> I, wish, I wish more people would. And it sounds like, and looks to me like, we've got a hunter in the big office up there. Uh, looks to me like maybe he kind of gets it a little bit. Yes, know? sir. I'm pretty proud of him. Yes, sir. Um, it's been a real pleasure, Alan. Thank you, Ron. Sure. Oh, they're here. They've got to be here. That one literally, I stepped on it. Did you and I shoot the same bird the first shot? <laughs>